Good morning, folks. I have a story to tell. A few years ago, I was hanging out with this guy, Jack Burley, and a bunch of other machinists, and there was a conversation going on about tool holders, and I'm just kind of listening in the back of my head, and so people were throwing out some stats and numbers and design and engineering behind tool holders, and then Jack said something to the tune of, I helped develop the ISO standard, and I thought, I'm gonna listen to that guy. I've for years been wanting to get Jack on camera to talk about tool holders and specifically one of the questions that I've heard some controversial opinions on, which is should you balance a tool holder? Um, so Jack, can you introduce yourself and who you are at Big Kaiser, your history there? I'd love to talk about balancing, but also a general primer on you know the role a tool holder plays, why it's so important for making accurate parts, tool life, all that stuff you're so passionate about. Hey, thanks for having me here today. Um, always good to see a shop. It's been a long time, but uh, my name's Jack Burley. I'm the president of Big Kaiser Precision Tooling. And uh, I think when we look at tool holders and its importance and, and how it works in the mach machining strategy, it's often overlooked. It's not something that's super critical for a lot of operators and programmers, but it does play a big role. And you know the performance of the cutting tool and the machine is really dependent on how well the tool holder connects all these things together. And I've always been an advocate that, you know, you're gonna have a process that needs every part of it right. And mm -hmm. the tool holder is very commonly overlooked. Mm -hmm. It's good enough to use this, it's good enough to use that, but every cutting tool needs its own type of tool holder. And to get the optimum performance, I think you really gotta look carefully at what you may have done in the past and what you should be doing, because mm -hmm. that technology changes a lot. Tool holder technology. It does. Yes. Really. There's a lot of different types and varieties out okay. there, and it's a, it's a it's a shifting target. Standard machines typically use a steep taper tool holder like a Cat 40 or a Cat 50 mm -hmm. or a BT or a BT 30, um, and that's not going to go away because it is an easy product to to use and and reproduce, and it's uh, very common. I don't think that's going to go away. But there's new ones out there uh, like the HSK, which is starting to gain a lot more popularity uh, for a wide range of op operations mm -hmm. like aerospace, uh, die mold and electronics and all that. Mm -hmm. On the few times I've had the chance to see shops in Europe, uh, at, at the risk of making a gross generalization, Cat 40 is gone there and HSK, uh, which is actually really cool because you know the way a Cat 40 works with the pool stud is it decreases its clamping pressure as you spin up the RPMs. With an HSK, you don't have to have a pool stud and the I'm gonna, you're gonna describe this better than me, but the internal clamping nature is such that you've got dual contact taper and you actually increase the, the rigidity of that rotating tool assembly as you increase your RPMs. Yeah, that's in a manner of speaking correct that uh, the clamping system goes inside the tool holder mm -hmm. instead of trying to clamp on a bolt on the outside mm -hmm. of the tool holder like a cat or a BT. Um, so in essence, yes, as you increase the speeds, the clamping fingers are trying to naturally go out with mm -hmm. it. Um, because everything does elastically move due to high speed rotation. So the HSK has that advantage, but it also has that disadvantage. And okay. I say that because on a, on a steep taper tool holder um, that, that's got some length to it and it's got the bolt on the outside, which pulls it in. Um, you can now though, take a very short tool holder and you can take a long cutting tool and project it down inside. Okay. So you're actually able to get a lot of the transfer of that power onto the cutting tool right by the bearings. If you have that oh. option, you know, if it's possible. Interesting. In the case of HSK, and I just ran across this before uh, a couple days ago, um, you're restricted there because that's all going inside there now. So your minimum gauge length out of the spindle face is at least one inch. Got it. Because you can't put anything down inside there. Right. You got re the, the retention system and you've got the, the coolant nozzles and all that right. stuff in there. So it, but it does have the, the accuracy of expanding due to high speed. And that's where steep taper doesn't have that option okay. because as that spindle does try to grow, it's going to pull it down in. So you don't have as good a control on Z axis like HSK because yeah. you got a stopper there as far as the face contact and uh, steep taper doesn't always have that unless you use dual contact like big plus. Well, that's what I was gonna say, with dual contact 40 big plus, you have that positive stop gauge length, right? You do, and, and that's, that's good to a point uh, for rigidity, uh, but for high speed operation, um, you still will see a slight deformation of the spindle. 
oh. due to high speed. So because it's it's moving out, you, you might lose a little bit of your taper contact compared to HSK. Got it. But conversely, you have a much wider length or longer length of taper engagement than you do with HSK. Got it. So if you're tooling up a new machine, you know, when I think about with a holder, I usually think of, of TIR. And actually, that's another funny anecdote. When I was just getting to know you, I was researching separately on tool life and uh, part accuracy, part quality. And your name showed up on a study that talks about a correlation between, I think it was every tenth of additional run out uh, or total indicated reading, I guess, is the technical uh, equivalent of TIR. But every tenth you have can result in a double digit decrease in tool life. It's substantial, but I use the tenth equals ten, which means a tenth run out adds or subtracts 10% tool life. So if you go from five tenths to four tenths, you should increase your tool life by 10%. And conversely, if you go from five tenths to six tenths, you should decrease it by 10%. That's crazy. So it would double if you went from five tenths to a thou, right. if you went from a high precision collet chuck to say a side lock end mill holder. So everything's a trade off and a balance. So what am I looking for? Am I looking for TIR? I'm looking for something that's absolutely gonna hold that tool in place. And if I'm looking at roughing operations with a half inch end mill, I'm probably not looking so much for the TIR as I am just for raw clamping force. And I'll compromise a little bit of that TIR. If I'm fine finishing, I want the absolute best TIR. And that's where I start looking at things like collet chucks, hydraulic chucks. But if I'm roughing, TIR is maybe not so critical. And I'm gonna be looking at the, the gripping force, the power shrink fit could be an option side lock end mill holders if I just want to make sure that I, I absolutely do not pull out the end mill when I'm cutting. Because we all know that it's tragic when an end mill pulls out <laughs> or slips or does anything. That, that's yeah. usually scrap or a ruined part Yes, or something. It makes for great blooper videos though on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. No, we, so we, we started out using ER-16s, uh, which I don't think were unusual in that, or ER-32s, and then um, you know, the runouts, I would say not bad, not a great scientific answer, but we realize we care about it, especially when we're doing that small work, the detail work on the small tools. And so that's where I think we picked up one of the mega chucks that has your high precision collets. It's got that really cool bearing wrench and the runout is, I mean, it's incredible. It does uh, have the advantage of the, the, not just the TIR that you're looking for, but the mass, the damping. So I always like to say when you're roughing, you know, the, the slender tool holders like heat shrink and all that aren't always an advantage. It's always sometimes a disadvantage. You want the mass around the tool to dampen it mm-hmm. and, and help drive the power from the machine through the tool holder into the tool without the vibration. W- would you say that dampening holds true even if you're say um, servicing with a 332nd end mill or, or slotting with a 116th end mill? Um, well, obviously then the damping doesn't have to be as critical because, you know, when you look at the natural frequency of this machine and the spindle, of course, it's not going to absorb at the same level on a small micro tool as it would on a larger tool. Okay. Um, it's important, but not nearly as critical. No. So then, you know, when you're looking at a 16th end mill or a three sixteenths, usually collet systems are very adequate to hold those okay. kind of tools, but hydraulics do exist uh, in the market that you can put those small tools mm-hmm. into. And I think for the high speed operation, they do bring some advantage. It's actually great uh, segue to a question I've always wondered, which is from a cost standpoint and not knowing anything more about a specific application, would you recommend a precision collet chuck or would you recommend a hydraulic where you've also got to buy relatively expensive sleeves or bushings to get it down to the yeah, size? If you've standardized your shop on a nominal shank diameter of say four millimeters, eighth inch, six millimeter, Mm -hmm. the hydraulic has the advantage because now you don't have to use collets, right? When you, whenever you do machining below um, three millimeters, you're usually working off a common shake like eighth inch or three millimeters. So you're not gonna need collets. And that, that makes perfect sense in those small tools to standardize on a common shank tool holder and never use the collets. Now, if you've got wire size drills and all kinds of small cutting tools that don't have the common shakes, then obviously the collets is oh. the best way to go. Fair enough. And, and uh, again, the impurities of the mark or the system that you're putting into, um, if you're, you're running relatively clean materials like stainless steel, easy to clean, collets make a lot of sense. 
But if you're in explain that dustier things like oh. uh, carbon fiber Got or it. you're you're dealing with uh, fiberglass and things like that, where it's really the dust and mm -hmm. and the, the sludge that comes out of that is really hard to clean, then something simple like heat shrink or hydraulic would make more sense. It's interesting. I, completely obvious point that I never thought of, which is the sealed nature of the system in the you know machining cast iron versus yeah, uh, yeah. forty one forty. Right. Huh. Um, okay, this is the question. I, I think this is so fascinating. Could you just describe what is this ISO standard, the G 2.5 we hear balanced up to, and then share your thoughts on balancing tool holders? Well, I, I was involved in establishing this standards. I was on the committee. I didn't develop. Okay. There were some mathematicians and scientists behind that, um, but it's called the ISO 16084. Okay. It's, uh, it was rolled out officially about three or four years ago. Um, and what it tries to do is bring some economies of scale to the world of tool holder balancing. Okay. We are a tool holder producer. That's what we do. That's mm -hmm. all we do is produce tool holders. So we know how to make them. We know how to balance them. What this standard tries to do is say to companies like us, here's how we need to balance our tools to be used in a real world situation because not every situation is the same, which is the interpretation of G2.5. Okay. Um, your situation is not the same as a shop across the street, which might be running much larger parts okay. with lower speeds. You're running smaller parts with higher speeds. But why is tool holder balancing the same from your shop to their shop? Mm -hmm. Although they're completely different worlds and yeah. need two different sets of parameters to work with. Okay. So what this standard does, it tries to say, if I'm the bigger shop and I don't need that level of sophistication, I still want to balance my tools what is a practical safe limit that will apply that I won't damage the machine and I'll get the, oh. the best okay. performance for the cost of balancing that tool versus maybe you need something more precise because you're dealing with something higher speed and you're dealing with finer finishes and you're dealing with smaller interfaces. Okay. Why try to balance a 50 taper tool holder to the same properties of an HSK32? Got it. One's going to go 800 RPMs. And, and what's unique about that standard is the old standard, I should say, which is, you know, more than 80 years old, is the smaller the tool holder, the more precise you have to balance it. And the bigger the tool holder, the less you have to balance it. So okay. on the same machine, let's say you have one that's equipped with a 40 taper spindle mm -hmm. and a 40 taper spindle can have a wide range of different weights of tools that go into it. You could okay. have a super light ER 16, you know, which only maybe weighs three or four pounds, and then you could have a, a big, long, heavy face mill weighs 15 pounds, mm -hmm. right? So you're saying, okay, it's a 20,000 RPM spindle either way. One, I'm probably mm -hmm. gonna be able to run 20,000, one, I'm probably not. <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, so I do try to balance the lighter tools better, but on that same machine, I'm supposed to balance them for 20,000 RPM. That heavier tool has a lot more tolerance than the lighter one, which is, really the backwards way of looking at it. the heavier the tool should be balanced more precisely than the lighter ones because it's going to do more damage well that's what i was thinking a, a heavier tool may rotate slower but it has the an imbalance could destroy spindle bearings much faster okay. than a lighter tool yeah right so what the new standard does is it tries to take those values into consideration okay it also takes into consideration not just the length and the weight of the tool but the type of operation you want to do so if i'm a piloted type of cutting tool which once it goes like a drill mm -hmm. is a piloted tool, if it engages into the workpiece, it's really now not free spinning anymore. It's got a piece got that's no longer cantilever, it's, it's supported. Mm -hmm. Why do I need to balance that so critically other than the time it takes to turn it on and put it into the part? Versus mm -hmm. an end mill, now that's free cutting all the time. Right. That should be uh, balanced much more precisely. So there's different levels, standard, fine, and then ultimate balancing. For that. And what, this happens you, when you guys machine a holder, it is balanced at your factory, but subsequent to post changes downstream, depending on the type of collet nut or the type of tool. I mean, a, a traditional rotating tool is not imbalanced like, like we use a boring head from you guys. I assume that that has to have imbalances because of the design of the boring head. What's on the left is not mirrored perfectly on the right. When we make those tools, we know what all the known imbalances are uh -huh. characteristic to that design. Um, and we can correct for those. Okay. So we know what's inside there. We know how to adjust, even for a boring bar. All of, the, all of your boring heads, uh, we know where it's set to have the optimum balance for it. Now, 
as you adjust it, you change that, right? right? So we have automatic balancing tools, but you know, for the smaller ones, usually we got them balanced in a position that at 10,000 RPM, you're not going to have any issues with it. Now, if you go to 20,000 RPM and you shift the size substantially off of where it should be, where we recommend, you're going to have imbalance issues. Um, and that's where you're going to start to see, uh, you know, the vibration really comes in. The, the machine will hum. You'll hear it. You'll, you'll hear it, it. Okay. yes. And when, when a machine is humming, just when it's rotating a tool holder, you know you're overspeeding the balance of that the tool holder should be used. So as soon as you start turning down the RPM, you'll notice that the humming starts to reduce. You're basically minimizing the, the amount of centrifugal force or asymmetrical sure, centrifugal sure. force that the spindle's seeing. It's mm -hmm. basically the bearings taking and absorbing the vibration. Got it. So yeah, all boring bars should be balanced at a position. Now, some of the older technologies don't, all of ours do. Okay. And that's why, you know, some people look at our, our equipment and we says, oh, you got so many accessories. Well, let's try to maintain the optimum balance for the tool running concentrically. Got it. Because every boring tool has to run off center to do its job. Got it. And so what about a traditional uh, high precision collet chuck that's balanced at the factory and is good to go? Generally, if it's a quality product, mm -hmm. um, we, yes, yeah, so we're going to do all the uh, post heat treat grinding, hard turning. We're going to put the clamping nut on, which has been piloted. Um, that's okay. an important feature. Um, okay. When you look at a clamping nut, if it's just locating on the threads, of course, you got some areas oh. that that can distribute differently. Yep. So um, a, a big area where I see mistakes is uh, you buy a tool holder and it says certified to 20,000 RPM. The certification usually from these companies, which is a sheet that says here, we balanced it and look at how good it is, but they haven't put anything on it. It's, it's free of a clamping nut. It's free of a collet. It doesn't have a pull stud. Right. It's basically a shaft. Got it. Right. Okay. But what's changing now is now you start adding parts. So we, we assemble all those parts and knowing that we're going to try to maintain concentricity throughout. It's kind of like you go out and buy a new pair of tires for your car. Um, if you balance just the rim, <laughs> Right. And say, okay, it's balanced. Now you put the tires on it and go try to use it. It's not going to be balanced Tiger anymore. Work. And that's what you're doing with these tool holders that are really certified at the factory. They haven't been assembled properly to put it all together. Now, quality products with piloted precision components mm -hmm. minimizes that. And you shouldn't need to balance okay. within normal operating limits, like 12,000 RPM on a 40 taper spindle. At 20,000 RPM, I'm going to say, yes, balancing should be looked at. Okay. I'm going to say it only exists, though, for the fine finishing. So if you're trying to get the, the good finishes and you're doing the ball nose milling and the slotting and you're looking for the ideal surface finishes, then over 12,000 RPM, and the standard would tell you, go from standard to fine balancing. And balancing, because that's happening at the high RPMs, is really not correlated to what you may measure as a TIR when you're just rotating a tool or putting it in a presetter? It, it, it doesn't, but it does. Because okay. the more TIR you have, the more imbalance you have. To okay, so, yes. fair point, um, yeah. if, Again, going back to a quality product, mm -hmm. um, a collet chuck, for example, that gives you only three microns or five microns of TIR, yes, you get better surface finish because you're engaging the flutes more evenly, but you're also improving the balance mm -hmm. because that's the eccentricity value of the tool holder assembly. If that piece of carbide is offset by uh, five tenths, that's an eccentric value that's adding to the imbalance. Right. So even though it's a quality tool, sitting off center isn't helping. And if, for folks watching that don't even know what balancing is, I always think of it as putting it into a, a, a specialized machine and then ultimately adding either weights or drilling material. Is that a fair? Yeah, that's pretty close okay. to what it does. Um, uh, the balancing machine basically is a spindle like uh, on your machine. Doesn't run at the RPM that you need to, to, to use it at, but all okay. it's doing is it's got some uh, uh, piezo crystals in there, which mm -hmm. measures the force of that tool trying to spin. Mm -hmm. And it, it measures these forces so that you know where you need to take heavy or light spots off of the tool. And in okay. some places you have to add tool uh, weight by mm -hmm. putting screws in. Other places you might reduce it by subtracting, such as milling or grinding off of it. Got it. And I, I don't like to do that, um, the, the process where you start milling and grinding tools, because um, once you do it, first time that should be all you ever do it. 
Um, but if you have a non-repeating system because the college chuck or whatever doesn't repeat, you start chasing around and you start putting cuts all over it. Where that's where the balancing screws would be much better. Is there like a shop like ours? You know, we don't have a balancer. I don't think we ever would justify one or need one. But let's say I really did have a couple of tools I wanted dialed in and perfected. Is there is that a service? Do people ever send out tools assemblies and have them balance externally? Yeah, we we can balance them. Most oh, really? of the tool other companies okay. will do that service for you. Um, what we're a little bit leery about though is tools that we don't produce and it's we fair. don't know what's in it. Okay. So if you send us a complicated uh, uh, reamer uh, mm-hmm. assembly, which has all these adjusting systems mm-hmm. built into it that we don't know about, sure. we'd, we'd probably put the caveat, yeah, we'll do this, but we don't know if we're gonna cut into something inside there that might Got it. be a problem. Um, adding weight's always a little bit easier, but it's complicated too, because then it's- Cool. Folks, I hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed. Jack, thanks for visiting the, the, the whole, I completely agree with what you say. People are so focused on, hey, I've got this brand of machine or I've got this software or this cutting tool, but man, the, the role the tool holder plays is literally, literally marrying them all together. We've certainly grown to appreciate. We check uh, TIR more than I ever thought we would. And, and we see the results. You can Good. see it sometimes with the naked eye, certainly with a loop or a microscope. Um, it matters for tool life, for finish, for accuracy. Um, yeah, we're believers. Cool. Good to hear, John. Thank you. Hey, take care, folks. See you soon.